now for all of you that are out there listening. I'm glad you know me. I need you just to close your eyes. And I need you to think about your personal relationship with the Father right now. How good he's been. This is what the Bible says, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and we will give attention to verses 9 through 11, but if you don't mind, brothers and sisters, let me get a running start. Let me start at, at verse number 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, <clears throat> but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulations are hard times, depending on the translation you have, produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope now hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out into our hearts by the holy spirit who was given to us for when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Do we see that church? <laughs> for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us. Nobody can love us like God. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible says, and we see it right here, that he demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But then here's the part I want to get to beginning in verse number nine much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him so he loved us so much that while we were still sinners he sent Jesus but his blessing did not stop there because verse 9 says much more having been justified and we'll touch that briefly by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him justification one way to remember that is God putting something in place and that's something being the blood of his son Jesus so that unrighteous people like us would be able to stand before him and seen as righteous. Am I making sense this evening? We, you know, some have operate from the standpoint that they have to get right for God. But as human beings, we cannot get right for God. We can only get right with God. Amen. Amen. Our righteousness is so inferior to his that the Bible says that it's like filthy rags. Amen. So even if we attempted to do it on our own, we still would miss the mark. So he, we needed a perfect sacrifice in his son Jesus who could wash away our sin and whose blood was powerful enough so that we would be able to stand before a righteous God 
and be seen as, a, as righteous people. But not only that, in verse number nine, one of the, one of the benefits of being positioned by the blood of Jesus is it protected us from God's wrath. Now step back for a minute, if you will. I'm gonna get to 10 and 11, and I, I'm not gonna keep you too long, but I just wanna touch something right quick. The Father decided that we were in such bad shape that in order to spare us from his wrath, he sent his son so that we will be put in a place, in a position where we were at peace with him and would avoid the wrath or the destruction that he has reserved for the unrighteous. You mind if I come sit next to you on the pew? Yeah, scoot over and give me a little room. Here in the great state of Texas, we, a lot of us own at least one firearm. Now, now to, to the elders, I'm not advocating anyone break the law or do anything ungodly. But just to give you an example about, to give us an idea of what God did when he saved us from his wrath. If an intruder entered your home, an unlawful intruder, and if I'm on dangerous ground, just tell me to slow down, brother. <laughs> and our families' lives were threatened. We wouldn't, amen, look at the sisters and nodding their heads, right? We wouldn't spare that unlawful intruder from our wrath, now would we? The, the only warning that they would get is if they heard us locking and loading before we pulled the trigger. Mm -hmm. And brothers and sisters in Christ, while we were sinners, we were destined to receive God's wrath. Right. However, he sent Jesus to prevent us from being on the receiving end of his wrath. He loved us so much that he sent his son to protect us from what was waiting for us had we not united with him. As we continue to go forward, and I hope I didn't steer anyone in the wrong direction, uh, my brother Taylor. For, yeah, we are talking about God and family, aren't we? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And as a title this evening, we'll talk about a relationship that will not disappoint. We are familiar with the concept of disappointment, aren't we? A working definition for disappointment is when reality and expectations don't meet. <laughs> That's when we are disappointed. However, Paul wanted us to understand that our relationship with God is not one in which we would be disappointed. He points out in verse number 11 that we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That means that we're in a relationship where whatever it is we expect God to do, he will not disappoint us. And just to, uh, if you don't mind, put a little, a little sauce on it. In Romans chapter four, verses 17 and in verses 21, 
if I could get away with preaching this passage every Sunday, I would. And I was sharing it with one of the brothers there at Huffsmith. Uh, we're located in Tomball, Texas. I said, if I could get away with preaching, preaching this passage every Sunday, I would. And he said, Brother Thorne, it would be just as relevant each, each Sunday. But here's why we know that being in a relationship with God will not disappoint us. In verse number 17, we see Paul talking about uh, God speaking to Abraham. He says, as, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who believe, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. We will not be disappointed with God because he's able to give life to the dead and call those things that do not exist as though they did. Next point, next thing I want to point out, verse number 21. The Bible says, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, as we return to verses, verse 11, we will not be disappointed in a relationship with God because there is nothing, can, there is nothing that can stop him from delivering on his promises. He's able to speak life to the dead and he's able to speak to, to those things that do not exist as though they did. The King James Version says, call those things which be not as though they were. We are familiar with God's work doing this in the creation. Nothing existed. However, he spoke and things, and things happened. He created the heaven and earth. He said, let there be light. He spoke and from his words alone, things that did not exist came into being. And brothers and sisters in Christ, would a God like that on our side, who has positioned us to be named among those who are righteous and has blessed us as the righteous, as his righteous, to be in a relationship with him whereby we're able to rejoice because everything he promises for us will happen should reassure us each and every day in every aspect of our lives that as long as the Lord is on our side, everything Thing will be all right. And especially church family, since the theme of the revival this week is God and family, even when it comes to our family matters, if we are united with God, though we may have some difficult moments from time to time, everything will be all right. The Bible teaches us that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We're also told in the book of Isaiah that God's word doesn't return void. So as long as we are united with the most high God, everything will be all right. Amen. Now, to manage what we have to do this evening, let me go ahead and just point out a few things and then we'll make some applications and the lesson will be yours. The first thing I want us to, to, to know by way of reminder is is that God wants a peaceful and loving relationship with us. We, we, we see in, in Matthew chapter 25, verse number 41, he designed hell for the devil and his angels. He, it is not his desire for us to perish, but to have everlasting life. We remember that good Sunday school scripture that we learned when we were children, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he's so serious about that that he didn't create hell with us in mind. But unfortunately, some of us, amen, I'll let, I'll let Brother Copeland and Brother Taylor and Brother Phillips deal with that. But I believe you have the point right now. Uh, secondly, 
Another, uh, by way of reminder, another familiar passage that should reassure us that God wants a peaceful and loving relationship with us is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And I'll just walk through this briefly, Brother Copeland, and then we'll get to the uh, family. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, when Jesus speaks and, and says, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father this house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you you are going and how can we know the way Jesus said to him I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me now Jesus said that in his father's house were many mansions or many rooms a place for all of us to be there and to be comfortable he, God wants to be with us so badly that he made sure that there was a place prepared where we could all be there and be comfortable. I was uh, talking to uh, my wife and sometimes we we reflect on how things used to be when we were younger and and we lived in Houston and sometimes our relatives would, would come to town. My mother is from uh, Henderson. Uh, my brother and I were born there but we grew up in Houston and the, remaining, the remainder of my siblings were born in Houston. But you know my uncles and my, my, my aunties I'm going to go ahead and say what we call them. I know the correct word is aunt but my uncles and my aunties and my grandparents would come down and, and it was a, a, a pecking order as to who got to sleep in the bed because our house was not a real big house. You know, my parents were just working people, amen, just as you are, working people. And that was a pecking order as to who slept in the bed. So, so at the top of the food chain, if you will, was, uh, was, was, was Paw Paw and, and, and grandmother. We called her Mama Louise. So they got a bed. And then after that, uh, the, the uncles and aunties, they, they had a bed. And when, and when all of the beds were gone, everyone slept on pallets on the floor. But, but you know, it seemed like that those times were good, you know, without all of the complications affiliated with technology and social media right now. I don't want to get off point. But the point that I'm making is that was not enough room for everybody to sleep comfortably in the bed. Right. However, the Lord thought about us so much that he made sure that he's going to make sure that we each have a place uh, a room if you will up in heaven with him so that we can surround him and enjoy and indulge in his presence throughout eternity God thought about us and he still loves us today just as much as he did when he sent Jesus but as I keep continue to go forward he wants a relationship with us and he doesn't want it to be a transactional relationship where as long as you do something for me I do something for you and we're good he wants this to be a close intimate uh, uh, a close intimate relationship between us and him so much so that in Ephesians chapter 5 he compares uh, his relation the, the, the relationship between the son and his church is compared to a relationship between a husband and a wife. Now please go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and listen to what the Bible says. I will begin reading in verse number 20. Um, I think I want verse number 25. Let's start there. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing 
but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. The relationship, husband, wife, a union between a man and a woman, according to God's blueprint. There are those who uh, suggest that there's a different blueprint. Well, they can make all the suggestions that they want to. Amen. It's only one thing wrong with those suggestions, and that is they aren't right. Amen. God's blueprint is marriage between a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. And the husband has a certain expectation from God, and the wife has another expectation from God. He points out that the husband is expected to love his wife as Christ loves the church. And he goes on to explain, to express rather, in verse number 28, that uh, he who loves his wife loves himself. Right. Now, this union between Christ and his church, I want to point something out right quick in uh, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Uh, uh, could someone re help me with that right quick? Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. 19, 7 and 8. Yes, sir. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Keep going. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. Uh -huh. His wife has made herself free. Okay, stop for a minute. The marriage of the Lamb has come. Mm -hmm. And the wife has done what? Made. Made herself what? Ready. Ready. Keep going. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Okay. So it was whose responsibility to be ready for this marriage? For the bride, to get the bride ready. It was the bride's responsibility, right? Right. So the husband, Christ, has a part to play. We, the church, have a part to play. Just stay with me. I'm going to be there momentarily. Christ does his part. We do our part. As Lord and Savior who shed his precious blood, who has salvation available to everyone on the face of the earth, the onus is on us to submit to his rule, to submit to his authority, to obey, to love him enough to obey his word so that we can be presented to him without spot and without blemish. Now, brothers and sisters, as we go into the entire families and, and talk about the husband and the wife, now, we know Jesus is perfect. Nothing imperfect about him. However, we, he still has a role to play. We are imperfect. And as imperfect people, we have a role to play. Husband and wives individuals, us, us is if you don't mind. We both are imperfect. Right. However, we both have a role to play. Right. Now when we look at what the, uh, what's expressed in Revelation about the wife getting ready, about the wife getting ready, nothing is said about Christ getting ready. Because Christ is perfect. Right church family. Christ doesn't have to do anything. It is up to us. But let us not forget the comparison that's made in Ephesians where the husband is expected to love his wife and treat his wife just as Christ treats the church. Husbands, we aren't perfect. Listen here, brothers and sisters. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 12 and 13. Well, let's go ahead and read that too while we're there. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13. I want verse 13, but we may need to touch 12 to get the, use your better judgment on that. What does the Bible say? Uh, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Keep going. For the work of the ministry. Keep going. For the edifying of the body of Keep going. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Keep going. And of the knowledge of uh, the Son of God. Uh-huh. Unto a perfect man. Uh-huh. Unto the measure of the stature 
until the measure of what? The fullness, the fullness of Christ. All right, now, now, now let's, let's put this all together and the gumbo will be yours. All right. Husbands, we ought to love our wives the way Christ loves the church. Christ made sacrifices. He didn't think twice about it. He kept the big picture in mind and he knew that if his family was to stay together and fulfill its purpose, which is to, uh, to, to, to give off the glory of God, he had to make sacrifices to do it. In our homes, we imperfect husbands, we still have that same responsibility to love our families enough to to make sacrifices so that as a unit we can glorify God. Amen. That is the purpose of the family. Amen. To glorify God as a unit. Amen. To show the world that Jesus loves through in spite of our imperfections so much that he's willing to work with us so that God can get glory. And as husbands, our love should be so strong for our wives that we love her so much much that as a unit we're able to glorify God now but here's the aim the aim or the, the target if you will in Ephesians 4 13 Christ is the standard we all should look at him as the standard to determine how well we're doing our jobs I've known brother Copeland for years but it's not going to help my family if I look at him and say he's the standard I need to live by to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Why is that? Because he's an imperfect standard. Hey, the Bible say if we, if we have no sin, we lie. So hey, Colossians 3, 9 tells us not to lie. And as my grandfather will used to say, well, ain't no use in starting it. Amen, somebody. <laughs> But let me give you an idea of what this looks like. You mind standing up? You mind standing up? How, how tall are you, man? Six one. Six one. All right, I'm five eight on a good day. All right, I, I I represent all of us. All right, I represent the husbands who are aspiring to love. Christ is taller than all of us. He's greater than each of us. And if we're all striving to meet His standard, then we as husbands we're reaching for that that perfection in Him so that we can provide that for our wives. Thank you for a minute. Now, now let me point out something else. While we reach for that standard, we have to be loving enough to allow our wives to help us with our imperfections. Come on, let, let me help you understand where I'm coming from. No, I'm just going to let me help you understand where I'm coming from. Spiritually, we are imperfect. That's why we are participating in God's sanctification process, right? But the key is, even though we husbands are imperfect, our wives are, are blessed. We've been blessed with our wives as assets to help us stay on the right path. Over in, over in one of Peter's epistles, it escapes me right now, please forgive me, charge it to my head, not to my heart. We see how a wife's example can move a husband in the right direction. Amen, somebody. So husbands, let us not be ashamed of our imperfections. And let us not feel less than when our wives want to help us work through that. Help. Yeah, that's the key word, help. Not demean. Because you wouldn't want to be demeaned. Not disrespectful. Because you wouldn't want to be disrespected. Not in a condescending manner. You wouldn't want to be talked down to. We are, you, we are a union. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are a husband and wife unit Amen. who have specific roles. Amen. Some of us may not manage money that well. Amen. As a husband, we got to ask ourselves, what is best for our family? Amen. For me to manage money and make bad spending decisions and come up short at the end of the month? 
or to allow my wife who may be an accountant by profession or a bookkeeper by profession or who may just have that knack for numbers and, and spending discipline manage the money. Right. See, look, when, when Rosemary and I first got married, you know, her background is in engineering, electrical engineering, and she took a lot of classes in math. She was working on her master's degree in math at one time. We made an agreement. And I told her, I said, baby, I'm the CEO, but you're the CFO. Mm -hmm. And her face lit up because she knows that no matter what I want to do, if the funds aren't there, she has some veto. <laughs> hey, man, somebody. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Sometimes, well, not sometimes, in a lot of instances, households need two incomes. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Nothing wrong with that. It's just sometimes it needs to happen. Actually, it needs to happen a lot as expensive as things are. But here's the key. The primary responsibility rests with a husband. That's biblical. But if my helpmate wants to help us meet our financial obligations, then we need to let her help. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let, 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 let me explain it. Let me explain it this way. Because in some cases, ladies earn more than men. Amen. But but let me let me help you understand where I'm coming from. There are ladies who have gone and prepared themselves to be a part of certain professions where the earning is more than the professions that husbands have chosen. And it, can, can we talk, can I, can I talk a little bit about me? All right, so, so let me tell you. I grew up in a home where from, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. No, because I, I got to respect, no, I got to respect my dad and mom. No, I know y'all used to it. I got to respect mom and daddy, you know, long years. Anyway, where, where at times, you know, my, my dad's earnings were, were like this. All right. And it put a strain on the family. So I made up in my mind that whatever I needed to do, I wasn't going to put that strain on my wife. Right. So I get married and I have all of this bravado. No, you can work. You do what you want to do with your own money. I'm going to take care of all this by myself. <laughs> we talked about this already. You do what you want to do with your own money. I'm going to take care of all this by myself. Eventually, well, so a so couple of things, you know, sometimes, you know, God gives us, you know, a whooping, you know, Amen. yeah, he, you know, he, he may give you about five lashes, mm -hmm. then when you don't get it, you get about 40. <laughs> <laughs> so the five lash example, my wife had gotten discouraged, didn't understand that. I was like, get over it. Why are you complaining? Do what you want to do with your money. I'm going to take care of all this. But then that 40 lash came where I had back-to-back -back layoffs. And that, 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 that little savings got drained. You see, the Lord had to allow my meat to be taken away so that I could appreciate my help. But look at it this way, church. How many of us have played sports or are at least familiar with, with sports? All right, how many, of, how many of us were really good athletes? <laughs> but, but it's like this. If you're playing a sport, whether you're a coach or you're on the team, you want the best athlete on the field, at least if you have good sense. You know, coach, you want the good athlete. Teammate, you want the best teammate on the field. I mean, unless it means you sit on the bench, but we're not going to get into all that. But the key is, brothers and sisters, we have sisters who aspire to be wives and who want good professions so that they can help their husbands attain as many goals as possible. It's not always a pursuit of money so that they can dominate or say, look, I run you, I control you. No, we have Christian ladies who say, I want a great profession so that I, so that I can help my husband 
meet our obligations and have the best life possible. Am I making sense? And brothers, we love our wives. We love them so much so that many of us will work seven or eight jobs to make sure that they're taken care of. But the key is, let us love them enough to allow them to help out. Am I, am I making sense? All right. So as I get ready to wrap this up, I went a little longer than I intended to. God gave us a model, a model for love, strong love, so much so that he sacrificed Jesus so that we would no longer be his enemies. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, God wrapped in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen of angels. Jesus, the one who was God, and in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh. That same Jesus went to Calvary, gave his blood so that we can be positioned as righteous and ultimately have an eternal union with him. That is his desire. And church family, when it comes out the families in our own household, our love should be so strong that we want to be together as a strong unit unto the glory and the honor of God. Amen. That's our purpose. And we, yes, we will disagree sometimes. We're humans. We have grown up in different households, different sets of rules. Some households didn't have any rules, amen. But we do what we do for each other. Well, the husband provides the spiritual leadership as laid out in scripture, driven by love, and the wife performs her role, submission, driven by love for God, not because she sees herself as less, and not because we see ourselves as more, but we see God as the, as the supreme example of love. We do what we do for each other, not because they are so great or because we are so outstanding. We do it simply because of who God is. Amen. As I get ready to close, if there's anyone here this evening who's not yet been united with Christ, he wants to save you and he wants to number you among the saved today. He went to Calvary and he gave his blood. And upon his resurrection, he said, he told his disciples in Mark 16, he that believe, go and teach all nations, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's like eating food. If we want the benefits of nutrients, we got to chew and swallow. We just can't chew and not swallow to get nutrients. We can't swallow without chewing. Can you imagine trying to do that with a large steak? In order for our bodies to get the nutrients, we got to chew and swallow. Likewise with salvation, we got to believe and be baptized for the remission of sin. Hebrews 11:6. the Bible says, for without faith it is impossible to please God. Everyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the reward of those who diligently seek him. Faith compels us to repent. Acts 17, 30, God at one time winked at ignorance, but now he commands us all to repent. Repentance is simply saying, God, you're right and I'm wrong. You have salvation and I need to be saved. Confess him as Lord in Christ, Matthew 10, 32, 33, and be baptized for the remission of sin, Acts 2, 38. And then for those of us who may have stumbled along the way, who may have forgotten that we are to love each other and treat each other according to God's standards because of what his expectation is for us and what he does for us daily. We all get distracted. The invitation is for you as well. If you need baptism, come on down. If you need prayer and you need encouragement, come on down. As together we stand and sing.